Yeah, come on, week three, recalculating. You guys excited to be here today? Awesome. Man, I am so happy and thrilled that I get to be with you guys this morning. My name is Pastor Jason Sterrett. I'm the children's pastor here at the chapel. And man, I got to tell you, I love what I get to do here with the kids and with the teams that are here. It's an incredible opportunity just to pour into them and help them grow closer to the Lord. And I'm just so excited to be able to share God's word with all of you today. You guys ready to have a great day? All right, come on. I need some excitement today. I need some energy. Um, Let me move this up here, right here. Now, we've been in the middle of this series, Recalculating. This is our third week, and uh, man, it's just been incredible. Week one, Pastor Q has been talking about uh, the importance of choosing and picking a destination. You guys remember these? Come on. Here we go. Now we're talking. The importance of picking a destination, having a vision for your life, for your family, for your marriage, for your business, dropping a pin on what you want that to be, making it a godly family, a godly life. And what we said was, no matter where we are, no matter how far away, no matter how many wrong turns have been made, God has a path, a route. It can be recalculated and you can find your way to that destination that God has for you. Isn't that awesome? Come on, that's good news, because I've taken some wrong turns in my life. But the importance of having the vision for your life. And he used uh, the scripture in Proverbs 29, 18 that says, where there's no vision, the people are unrestrained. Are you ready? (sighs) Right? Did I do okay? Did I do good? All right. Listen, it took me 50% of my message prep time just to get that sound effect right. Okay? But where there's no vision, where you don't have a vision for your, for your life, for your marriage, for your relationships, for your business, you're unrestrained. You're all over the map. And no matter where we are, there's always a way to recalculate and get to that destination that God has for us. And that's good news. Week two, we talked about dropping a pin. You know how you drop a pin on your iPhone right there? <laughs> dropping a pin on getting closer to God. And Pastor Q gave us a couple things. One of the things that he gave us was knowing God at another level. That's one step to getting closer to God. Just one step, knowing him at another level. You pray for five minutes, awesome. I'm encouraged by that. Pray for six minutes. It doesn't have to be a giant leap. It can just be one step. Isn't that good news? (laughs) That's good news for me. One step. Pray. One more minute. Read. One more half chapter. Just take another step with God so that we can become closer to him. Knowing him at another level. He talked about connecting with others regularly, growing yourself daily, and serving people. All of those turns and directions help us to reach our destination of being closer to God. So you guys ready for today? Week three, come on, woo! That's what I'm talking about, there you are. We are gonna drop a pin, you ready? Drop a pin on healthy relationships. Everybody say, ooh, relationships. (laughs) We're going to drop a pin on healthy relationships. How do we get there from wherever we are on the map? How do we get to those healthy relationships? This healthy relationship pin is super important, incredibly important, and I'll tell you why. Because this pin and having healthy relationships will affect every other pin that you drop in your life. You want to be a godly father? You're going to need some healthy relationships to help you make it here. You want to have a godly family or godly relationships, a godly business, you're going to need healthy relationships to help you get there. Because healthy relationships can help you get there or they can take you the opposite direction, right? That's why it is so paramount that we find a way to make more healthy relationships in our lives. And something that we need to know as we move forward is this. On the way to getting there from wherever we are on the map, relationships can make the journey either incredible or absolutely disastrous. Did you know that you and I were created, hardwired, designed to be in community with one another, to have relationship with one another? Uh, Pastor Q gave us this line last week, isolation is a hallway to destruction. We need each other. I want you to turn to the person on your left and right and say, I need you. Do not make it creepy. Thank you for trying. I know that's literally impossible to do, but thank you anyways for trying. (laughs) Let's read this verse in Ecclesiastes chapter 4. It says, two 
are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. We need relationships in our lives. Now, what kind of relationships and with who? That's completely up to you. But remember, relationships can make or break your trip. How many of you have ever uh, seen a TV commercial uh, depicting a road trip? Anybody seen that on TV? Anybody watch TV like I do? Oh, good. Normally, there's about four 20-somethings, and they're all just ridiculously good-looking, very fit, athletic. They're in a car. Music is jamming. Everybody's smiling. Everybody is happy. They've got soda. They've got snacks. They've got music. If the, if the car has a top that comes down, somebody's probably up there just kind of riding the wind. I mean, you've seen that, right? It looks amazing. It looks glorious. How many of you have ever been on a real road trip? Yeah, it is nothing like that at all. There is nobody smiling, nobody laughing, especially if you have these types of people in your car. The are we there yet people. Five minutes into a 20 hour trip, are we there yet? Come on, you're killing me right now. Stop every five miles to use the restroom? Hmm, yeah. At some point you just stop asking and you just start pulling over every five miles and say, all right, there you go. Constantly adjusting the music. The music's building. It's about to get to the chorus. You're about to go, whoa, and they just switch to loving you. <laughs> and you're like, you got to be kidding me. I'll be honest with you. That one's me. Yeah. I can't, just a chronic music changer, just constantly. And my least favorite, the backseat driver. Just constantly constantly upset about every choice you're making. Yeah, I'm going to take a left at the Walgreens. No, you cannot do that. You have to go past it and then make the right after that. Frustrating. Have you guys ever experienced these type of people in your car on a road trip? Yes or no? Okay, better question. Have you ever experienced these type of people just in your life? Let's take another look. The are we there yet people. These people are the relationships we have in our life that are impatient. They're unhappy with where they are in life or unhappy with where you are in life. Anybody ever experienced one of those? Stop every five miles to use the restroom. These are our high maintenance relationships. And as soon as I said that, I know that a mental image just popped into your head of that person that is the high maintenance relationship in your life. These people are constantly needing your attention and draining your energy. They're slowing you down. What about the next one? Constantly adjusting the music. These are the controlling relationships in your life, trying to force you into joining their cause or their attitude. And lastly, the backseat driver, overly opinionated, has something negative to say about every single choice you make. You ever experienced those people in your life? Here's the truth about these people. Those people could suck the life out of a five minute drive to Chick-fil-A, let alone the journey of a lifetime, right? Our relationships influence our level of joy during the journey, and they help determine whether or not we're going to make it. We've got to figure out what to do with the people that are around us because they can help you either enjoy the ride or make you want to jump out of the car. It's so important to look at who we have around us and recalculate a route to healthy relationships. All right, so in your bulletin, there are some blanks written down there so that we can all stay together for you guys to fill out. So here we go. Here are the things that you have to decide in your heart about your relationships. Number one, I will nurture my important relationships. I want you to think in your mind, who are my important relationships? Some of you are thinking, okay, my mom, my dad, uh, gosh, my kids, my friends, my teachers, maybe a, a coworker. Uh, the cool thing about Scripture is it gives us a clue in identifying what important relationships really are. In Proverbs 27, 17, it says this, Iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, I don't know what your Friday night looks like, but I'm pretty sure it's not you in your living room with the iced tea just sitting there sharpening iron just for funsies. No. Why do you sharpen iron? You sharpen it for a purpose. 
You sharpen it to be used for something. So here's how we're going to identify important relationships. An important relationship is any relationship that encourages you toward the destination that God has for you. They push you, influence you, and shape you towards your godly intended purpose. This. Wherever these are in your life. Godly friend, godly life, godly family, godly business. Whatever that destination is that you've decided during this series. An important relationship will help shape and sharpen you towards your godly intended purpose. That's how you identify an important relationship. These are the important ones. And the way that you nurture them, so now we can identify them, now let's figure out how do we nurture them. It's very simple. Time. You have to give them time. You give those people as much time as you can. You ask them questions. You let them speak into your life. You let them lovingly and biblically put you back on course. You make yourself available to those who will shape you towards your godly purpose. Time is the key ingredient in nurturing, nurturing our, our relationships. It's a TV remote. I'm going to tell you a story about my life. I'm going to tell you a story about where I missed it. You guys like watching TV? I'm a big TV movie buff. Love it. It's great stuff. Not always, but sometimes. I came home after a long day of working, and uh, my son Nolan, who was about two at the time, uh, he comes up to me. And now I had sat down on the couch. I had my drink. I had my snack. I was laying down on my wonderful, beautiful couch. You have a special relationship with your couch, right? It's just, it's your favorite place to be sometimes. And I, and I just turn on the TV, and I start clicking through the channels, watch some Sports Center, just watching it, just hanging out. And up comes my little two-year-old. And he just looks at me, and I'm like, hey, bud, how are you? How was your day? And he didn't say anything because he's two. Um, but what he did next profoundly changed me. He looked at me, and I just was like, oh, okay, a staring contest, great. I'll just keep watching TV. And I feel this little hand reach out, grab the remote control out of my hand. He took the remote, and he put it on the table, and in place of it, he gave me a storybook. And it was one of those God moments where you do this. Oh! For real? Did this two-year-old just teach me something incredibly valuable about my life? Oh, okay, God. He had uh, magnified a problem. I was pouring my time into something that wasn't important. While something desperately important, a little two-year-old, he knew what was up. He's like, no, 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 Dad, you don't need this. You need to spend time with me. That's how you nurture relationships. What my two-year-old showed me is that you have to recalculate, there it is, recalculate where you invest your time. We have to be able to identify which are the important relationships because they'll shape us and sharpen us towards our intended purpose. And then we have to take those relationships and pour oodles, yes, oodles of time into them. That's how we nurture them. We have to recalculate where we invest our time. You have to ask yourself the question sometimes, yeah, where am I investing my time? I, am I investing the time only in, in things that I'm interested in and things I want to do, but not necessarily the most important things? It's a tough question to ask. But if we want to reach this pin of healthy relationships, which affects all the other pins, we have to ask the question, where am I investing my time? So we know that we need healthy relationships and that they're important to making it to our destination. But what do we do with those relationships that we're not sure about? The ones that are a little broken. Here's the next thing we have to say. I will restore my broken relationships. And here's how we're going to define a broken relationship. A broken relationship is any relationship that has a potential. Everybody say potential. It has a potential for being important and helping you towards your destination, but has stalled because of hurt or pain or lack of trust. Let's go to the Word. This is what the Word says. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. And here's the kicker. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And that's really the key to forgiveness, isn't it? Forgive 
as the Lord forgave us. When we've been hurt by someone and a relationship has broken down, our natural tendency is to assume that the person who hurt us is just going to do it again. The assumption keeps us from fully restoring trust and love to the relationship. And today, I know that when we talk uh, in forgiveness in churches, a lot of times we'll talk about the other person. We'll talk about what they did, how they did it, how awful it was. But today, will you look inward with me? Forgiveness is really more about us than the person who hurt us. And so let's take a look inward. Uh, I brought with me, since we're talking about road trips and recalculating, some snacks. Who's hungry? Yeah? All right. Thank you for being honest. I appreciate that. So I'm going to open these up. The pretzels. Pretzel stick. <sighs> I'm telling you, there is nothing better than just smelling the freshly opened bag. Now, here's, I love, listen, I love food. I'll just be honest with you. I love some food. Thank you. Amen. I got an amen about the food. Good. These are important to me. These are precious to me. These represent my trust and my love. They are special to me. Hey, Mr. Dave, I love you. Hey, it's good to see you. Give me a hug. I'm so glad you're here. I'm going to give you this Thank you. because you're my friend. Thank you. And I trust, now listen, <laughs> listen to me. This is important. This is my trust. This is my love. And I'm giving it to you. I just want you to take it in both hands. I want you to lift it up in the air. I'd like for you to break it apart. <laughs> what? What? I can't believe that you would do that to me. I gave you my trust, I gave you my love, and you just broke it. How dare you, sir, how dare you, sir, sit there and take my trust and love and break it. Our relationship now is broken. <laughs> don't you think that he should apologize to me? Yes, come on, don't you think he should apologize? Apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, you know what? You hurt me, but Lord knows I have to forgive you. I gotta forgive him, don't I? So I'm going, listen, I forgive you. I forgive you. Come here. We're friends. We're friends again. I love you. But I got more pretzels. Here we go. Who wants one? Here you go. Here, that's for you. Hi there. Hi, how are you? Some pretzels. And you, sir. How are you? That's, that's for good. Trust and love. I'm handing out trust and love. These are my relationships. I'm handing out trust and love. I have a feeling if I were to throw these, there would just be a mad dash. We'd probably have to call an ambulance. We won't do that. But listen, I'm handing out trust and love to all of my relationships like it should normally be. But when I get back to, to Dave here, oh, oh, hey, hey, man, hey, yeah, yeah, no, I forgave you. I forgave you. Listen, God knows. He wants us to forgive. I forgave you. But when it comes to restoring trust and love, yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> he, he broke it. He, you saw, you, you're my witnesses. You saw him break it. I can't give him that. I am expecting him to just break it again. Isn't that what we do with relationships sometimes? We say, oh yeah, man, I forgive you, we're all good. But when it comes to restoring the relationship, oh no, 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 you can't have my trust and love, no, because you're just gonna break it again. What's that verse say? Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Is that how Jesus forgives us? Let me, let me guarantee you something. He is not in heaven saying, oh, that's it. James, he sinned again. That's it. My love and forgiveness, done. I'm finished with you, sir. You're done. That is not what he does. We are commanded to forgive as the Lord forgave us. Do you guys understand um, the concept of restoration? Restoration is restoring something to its original condition. I cannot have a restored relationship with Dave if I'm just expecting him to hurt me again. I have to recalculate my expectations of the people I'm trying to forgive. Because if all I do is look at him and expect him to hurt me, I can never fully give him trust and love, can I? I have to change my expectations if I'm wanting to restore relationship. So here we go. Let's try this again. Hey, oh, Dave, nice to see you. Oh, man, yeah, here we go. Trust and love. I'm going to give this to you. Here, take it. It's okay. It's all right. I want you to lift it up in the air. Come on. Now, I know. I know, you're, I know you're skittish. Put it up there. Put it up there. Go, go, go. Quick. I want you to break it for me. Go ahead. Break it. <laughs> He's breaking a small piece. <laughs> it's still broken. Doesn't matter how small. 
ah, you know, that kind of hurt me. But you have potential. Remember that word potential? He has a potential for helping me be a godly father. He has potential to be a healthy relationship, an important relationship, one that shapes me toward my godly intended purpose. So that is how I know he's worth restoring to healthy relationship. And so I look at him and say, yes, I forgive you. Here's another. As a matter of fact, take the whole bag. Is that not how Christ forgives us? It's what the scripture says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Fully restoring trust and love to its original condition. The potential part is important, people, because I'm going to tell you something. You are not a doormat. Forgiveness is not to be used as an excuse to just stay where you are and get beat up. That's not what I'm saying. That's why the potential part of this is important. When you look at a relationship that is broken, you ask yourself, is this a relationship that could be important? Is this a relationship that could help me get there? And if it is, I have to fully restore trust and love, and I have to recalculate my expectations of what Dave is going to do. I'm going to expect him to get it right the way Christ, God, expects us to get it right. It has to be restored, but there has to be potential. And if there's not potential, yes, forgive them, but do not restore relationship. Because if there's no potential, that takes us to our last category. If it's broken and it has no potential, it's a harmful relationship. And here's the next thing that we have to say about our relationships. I will sever my harmful relationships. A harmful relationship today, we're going to define it like this, is any relationship that is either unnecessary or that pulls in direct opposition of the destination that God has for you. Let's take a look at unnecessary relationships. Let's go to the Word. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. I put the words in parentheses there. I added those. That's not in the Bible. I just added them so that you could see something. What does it say? Companions. Companions. Plural. Lots of them. A bunch of them. Companions. Low level of relationship. Just acquaintances, but a bunch of them. Friend. Singular. Higher level of relationship. Deeper amount of buy-in. Singular. Maybe... Maybe you have too many companions that are sapping your time and your energy away from pouring into the important relationships. We have to scale back the quantity of shallow relationships to make room for the important ones. I want you to picture yourself in a car. Mentally, I want you to look around. There is a finite number of seats. There's only so many. And if you have a bunch, many, plural, shallow relationships, they are taking up seats on your journey where an important relationship could sit and help you make it to your intended purpose. We have to let go of unnecessary relationships. Let's look at relationships that are in direct opposition. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says this, Do not be misled, turned away, pulled in a direction that is not where God is wanting you to go. Do not be misled by bad company. Uh, by, uh, sorry, bad company corrupts good character. That's what it does. Don't be misled. Don't be taken off course. Maybe you have people in your life that are pulling you away from your godly intended purpose. I'm going to share with you a story that I heard a long time ago about a train. It's a train in Lyon, Spain. A train like that. Not that one, but it's a train, so it'll work. Go with me. Lyon, Spain. The El Toro Tunnel. 1944, I believe. Here's what happens. A train enters a tunnel. Passenger train. The front engine stalls. They're stuck in this tunnel. No way out. Now, this, this uh, train actually had two engines, one in the front, one in the back. And so the back engineer says, okay, I'm going to save the day here. I'm going to pull the train out of the tunnel. Now, right about the time he did that, the front engineer, he gets his engine working again. And so he says, okay, it's time for us to move forward. And so he starts pulling the train forward. This goes on for a couple of minutes. 
both confused as to why they are not moving. All the while, carbon, carbon monoxide is filling the tunnel. 500 people died in that tunnel because there was something or someone pulling the train away from its godly intended purpose. You start to see the importance of identifying harmful relationships, ones that pull in direct opposition. You'll never get to where you need to go if you let them linger. You have to deal with them. And I'll be honest with you guys, this one is the hardest one for me. It may be the single most important one, but it's the hardest for me. I've had to do this, and it's not easy. I've had relationships in my life that were pulling in direct opposition of where God wanted me to be. And my personality, I'm what you would call a people pleaser. I like people to be happy. And if they can be happy with me, that's even better. And so can you imagine how hard it is for me to look at someone and say, yeah, you, you got to go. You got to go. I need to call to your attention something. These people who are pulling in direct opposition of where God has called you to go will not always be the easily identifiable enemy. That would be too easy. Sometimes these people are people that we've had relationship with for years. People that we have loved for years. People that we have fought with, bled with, worked towards a purpose with. But somewhere, somehow, along the road, they either became unnecessary or they started pulling in direct opposition of where God has called you to go. Where in your life are you saying, get out. I know it sounds harsh. I know it even sounds wrong maybe a little bit, but it's not. Because anything, any person or anything that keeps you from arriving at this incredible destination that God has for you has got to go. It's got to go. This has to become so important to us that we're willing to do whatever it takes and say goodbye to whoever we need to in order to arrive at being a godly father, godly mother, godly spouse, godly grandparent, godly student. We have to let this be so important and precious to us that we are willing to recalculate our passengers. We've got to recalculate our passengers. We have to ask, all right, who's along for the ride? Between the green pin and the red pin, there's a lot of space and a lot of time. And you have to ask, who are you taking along for the ride? Would you close your eyes, bow your heads with me? I just want to pray with you before we go. But before we pray, let me tell you what I believe God wants us to get today. I believe that God wants us to leave this place being able to identify what kind of relationships that we have right now. The important ones, the broken ones, the harmful ones. And I believe he wants us to take steps to invest our time into the important ones, to restore the broken ones that have a potential to be important, and to sever the harmful ones to make room for more important, healthy relationships so that they can shape and sharpen you towards your godly intended purpose. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you, Lord, that your word changes us every time. Father, I pray for everybody that's in this room right now. I pray for my chapel family. I pray for all of us, God, that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us wisdom to identify which relationships are important, which ones are shaping us and sharpening us towards our godly intended purpose. Give us wisdom to know how to invest more time into those. Oh God, I pray that you would give us courage. 
God, give us courage to restore broken relationships that have that potential to be important. Give us the courage to change our expectations of people. That we won't expect them to get it wrong, but we will forgive them the way that you forgave us and we will expect them to get it right so that we can fully restore to the original condition the trust and love for a healthy, important relationship. God, give us courage. Lastly, God, I pray that you would give us passion and that you would give us devotion so that these red pins, these destination pins, these pins that we've dropped in our life saying, I want to be a godly person, have a godly family, have godly relationships. We would be so passionate and devoted to that cause that we would be willing to sever the unnecessary and to sever the things that are in direct opposition of us reaching it. God, we know that that destination is going to be something so incredible and amazing that we can't even wrap our heads around it. And we are so thankful that you are a God that loves us and has given us the opportunity and chance and is willing to show us the route and the path to get to something incredible. Father God, I thank you that you're going to help us make it that we are going to do the work and have healthy relationships in our lives so that they can help us make it to all the other destinations. God, we love you. We praise you. We are so thankful for who you are in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for letting me spend some time with you sharing God's word. I had a blast.